Did you know that you can now join my YouTube channel? And to kick it off, I'm currently offering an incredibly low membership of only $2.99 a month. You get special badges next to your name so you stand out from the rest. You can also access special custom HRU emojis to use in live chats and in comments. Plus, I'll be adding some exclusive and early release member-only videos from time to time. Help support this podcast and let's build a community right here on YouTube. Join now. My first time featuring in, I think, Indiana, I had a guy who came to the club and like wanted me to like pee in a cup for him or like, mm-hmm. can, I, can I come back to your, you know, can I come to your hotel? Like, I would love to pay you to pee on me. And I was like, by then I was like, yeah, sure, no problem. <laughs> and, he, and he showed up, but he stopped by the drugstore on the way and picked up like a bottle of perfume from like the, whatever the drugstore was and some like, and some scented body lotion and bought a bottle of cheap champagne and some waters and like some chocolate and like, and flowers and like brought it to me. It was just like so sweet that that was my first like those were my first experiences. Yeah. Do you think that maybe because these guys have a kink that most people would find repulsive, that there's some vulnerability there? And so like, they're just so grateful to find somebody who's willing to engage in that with them and not shame them about it. So like, they're, they're like grateful. They're like, Oh, let me treat this woman like a princess because she's not making me feel bad about this yeah. thing that I'm into. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I'm, you know, over the years I've come to discover that, you know, there are people who, you know, that who just want to like cuddle, mm-hmm. right? And there's so much shame attached to that based on the type, you know, the idea of what masculine, masculinity means and how they're, you know, how, how they're treated when they don't fit that stereotype. Mm-hmm. So it's like when they find someone who's willing to indulge and engage with them in these ways, they're just kind of like, oh my God, this is amazing. <laughs> like- so people's idea of the typical guy who would pay a sex worker for an in-person service is drastically different than what you experienced. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, and it's interesting. I mean, when I got, when I was younger, when I was in my twenties, most of my in-person clients were definitely white men, cis white men in their forties and fifties. Um, now that I am older, I find that my demographic has completely changed. Like I I would say 10 years ago, my demographic started to change. And now my, my fans and clients tend to be black and brown men between the ages of 20 to 22 to 36 Mm -hmm. or between the age of 40 and like 65. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that there are a lot of these younger men who their first experiences with porn was watching me. Mm. And so they're, it's, it's like they're, it's their, like their bucket list to be able to meet me, have a conversation with me. Like the, it's the older woman that they get to learn from. Right. Um, and then the younger, the older guys are guys who's, they've grown alongside me throughout my whole career. So there's that nostalgia factor. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, but definitely it's totally different. I mean, I, I find that, you know, I've had several clients who their first experiences with sex period have been with sex workers Mm. and it's allowed them to be able to learn and grow and explore in, in a safe capacity. Um, and, and of course there's also the, you know, the wall street folks who are, you know, who just don't have time to cultivate relationships. But I think that this idea that we have that, Every single, you know, client is someone that a sex worker wouldn't normally have sex with. It really, you know, stigmatizes not only the us as workers, but also the clients themselves as well. You mm-hmm. know, it's like we we want to be able to have these kind of like to make let everybody feel comfortable to be able to explore their sexuality in in safe spaces. Um, you know, even just to be able to identify to their their partners, like the type of things that they're interested in, you mm-hmm. know? I mean, like, I think one of my favorite experiences was a 75-year-old man who was a submissive and very much into heavy impact play mm-hmm. and had been married for 
40 years and his wife didn't know that he was kinky. Mm -hmm. And as he got older, it became harder and harder for him to access these BDSM spaces because of ageism. Like he would go into a space and nobody would want to play with him. And so like he, when we spoke, like just having that conversation with him and also going through all of the things like, well, what is your, you know, like, what are your medical conditions? Like, are you sure that you're safe to do this? Like, do you have any issues with your heart? Like, you know, like going through that stuff with him and it allowed me to be able to feel safe to play with him and to explore something that this person hadn't done in 30 years. Mm -hmm. And when we, when our scene finished and he climaxed, like he cried. Yeah. And it was because it's like, it was the first time that he had had sex, even though there was no penetration either way. Like it was the first time he'd had this kind of sex in three decades. Yeah. And I mean, and, and that is, that's really powerful. Mm -hmm. You know, we, so many of us live our lives closeted in terms of what it is that we're interested in and like, and so, um, to be, you know, for people to be able to access those kinds of outlets is important. Yeah. You know, that's one of the, the kind of human interest stories that I've heard so many times on this podcast, interviewing different sex workers who do in-person sex work and just these stories of these sex workers being able to have these experiences with these people that don't normally have access to anybody who'd be willing to indulge them in their fetishes or their afraid of women for whatever reason, or they're disabled Yeah. or they have, like, I, I spoke to Alice Little and she talked about working with men, you know, on the spectrum and who have Mm -hmm. sensory process, sensory processing disorders and how difficult it is for them to just like have a regular date with a regular woman. Yeah. And, you know, just like how she kind of learns to navigate Mm -hmm. whatever their like very specific needs are. And just like what, and you come to realize it's like an incredibly rewarding and like, it can be an incredibly rewarding and fulfilling experience. And like the stigma that we have against sex work. And even, you know, somebody like me who's been in the industry for 24 years almost, um, because I've never personally performed in sex work. I've always been behind the camera. What I've learned about it from people like you is really, you know, opened my eyes to just, I don't know, like sexuality in general. And like the the human connection that we're all looking, looking for. for. And men so often look for that in sex. Yes. And we don't like, we don't acknowledge that. Yep. And it's just like, I don't know. I guess that's yeah. my long-winded way of saying yeah. what I think you do is amazing and beautiful. Thank you. You know, something that I realized um, a couple of years ago is that um, I, you know, I have executive dysfunction. And so like there are certain like holding, you know, holding a, a regular day job is really hard for me because I show up late, late all the time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like I have time blindness and it's, you know, as a, even the mainstream porn is very challenging because, you know, being placed on time, remembering certain things or details and being undiagnosed with executive dysfunction has been, you know, and, and being undiagnosed as neurodivergent was really challenging for me and my, in my job, even maintain, even though I've had web- websites since 99, it's like, I've had, it's, it was hard to maintain consistency in that online work because, the administration part is very challenging for someone with executive dysfunction. So it's like to be able to, you know, have someone, it's much easier for me to like answer emails when I can, Mm -hmm. you know, screen someone when I can and make sure I get my deposits and then go and see them to make the same kind of money um, or more money than at the time I was making on my websites um, without, without having to go through all of those steps in order to get there. Right. Mm -hmm. It's like, the administrative part of web, of like the digital properties is very overwhelming for a lot of sex workers. And it's just much easier to have sex with somebody mm-hmm. than it is to, it's like, I have to get ready, shoot the content, edit it, put it up online, you know, schedule it, put it online, do the marketing, do mm-hmm. the socials. Like, it's like, that's a lot of steps to get from being naked to actually collecting a paycheck. Yeah. And so it's like being able to just be like, oh yeah, sure, no problem. Like, you know what I mean? It's so much easier. So I personally prefer online work, I mean, in-person work as well. And plus like, you know, I had gotten to a point where 
you know, I was paying my webmasters and the hosting companies more money than I was paying than than I was paying myself. Like I was paying myself less than I would charge other people to shoot me. And also tube sites. And, you know, so being able to do in-person work and meant that I was making the same amount of money as porn in a much safer environment because I was using condoms and also didn't have my image all over the internet. Mm -hmm. Um, So like I personally prefer it, but, you know, because of of COVID, like everybody else, you know, or like so many other people, like I had to go back and move online. Mm -hmm. Um, And even that, it's been a learning curve. I mean, everything is so different than it was 15 years ago when I took my websites down um, and relearning that. And, you know, now I have much better tools to be able to manage that work, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I mean, everybody who says like, oh, you know, like sex workers don't do any work and like they don't, they, they don't think no about all, all these girls like making, you know, all this money and OnlyFans and stuff, just all the work that goes behind that and, and creating a website. And yeah, I run my own site and paying the hosting companies and affiliates and then the CMS program. It's like, it's a lot. There's a lot of behind the scenes. It costs. is a it's lot. Crazy. It is a lot of, of behind the scenes costs and time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you are not one, you know, one of the 1% of performers who's making twenty, fifty, a hundred thousand dollars yeah. a month, how do you hire people to do all of these things mm-hmm. for you? Mm-hmm. And, you know, most sex workers that I know are doing the jobs of, you know, nine people yeah. and, you know, and they're, they're, they're not making an hourly rate that mm-hmm. they should, that they deserve yeah. for all that labor. Yeah. Did you know that you can now join my YouTube channel? And to kick it off, I'm currently offering an incredibly low membership of only $2.99 a month. You get special badges next to your name so you stand out from the rest. You can also access special custom HRU emojis to use in live chats and in comments. Plus, I'll be adding some exclusive and early release member-only videos from time to time. Help support this podcast and let's build a community right here on YouTube.